Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I hope you can hear me. If you can't, try to make some uh, note about that in the questions box. If you're having any audio problems, you wouldn't have heard me say that, but um, uh, hopefully we'll, you'll be able to communicate with us. I did want to let you know a couple of things up front. Um, I, uh, first of all, welcome. I really appreciate you coming here. It's uh, uh, interesting times we're living in, and uh, we kind of hastily put this together over the course of last week as it became obvious that the legislature is going to have a special section, special session coming up on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday of next week. Um, and I just wanted to uh, put, the, put something together so that I would have an opportunity to hear from as many people as we could organize given that short time. So we publicized this via email and Facebook and I'm really glad that you guys who are here uh, saw this and are making time to do this um, on a beautiful Saturday. Um, hope you were able to get your bike rides done and some good walks out this morning. Um, I also want to tell you that we've got a handout for everybody in the documents folder that you ought to be able to see on the right side of your screen. Um, my screen is a mirror image of me, so I can't really tell which way I point to you. But over on the right hand side of your screen, as you look at it, you ought to be able to see a documents uh, section of your webinar broadcast tool. And in there is a little document about the topics that we intend to cover at the special session. And I'd like that to be kind of the basis of, uh, of what we talk about today, about questions that I am going to answer and uh, hope that uh, brings up some questions in your mind. If you have questions um, during this, uh, I hope that it will work really well for us to interact uh, virtually like this. And uh, we'll you can raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button. Uh, again, that's over on the right hand side in your in your uh, webinar tool. Uh, well, that way we'll know you want to ask a question. Hopefully it'll work uh, well to give audio back and forth. And if not, you can always type your questions in the questions box. Um, we've got some people who will help alert me to those kinds of questions. And Brian and Laura Lee are helping me on the technology side here. And I'm just going to say out front that Brian and Laura Lee, if people have questions in there that I don't notice, I would uh, just be just fine if you guys jumped on to let me know who has a question uh, and who we're going to be hearing from. Just because I'm standing here, I, I can't read everybody's names um, on the on the display board. But with that introduction, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we expect to do in a special session coming up. And so I'd encourage you guys to be looking through that. Uh, document that we posted in documents. It's got about eight different topics for potential legislation. I'm going to highlight a couple of those. Um, some of those are kind of non-controversial. Like one of the things we're going to do in the legislative session is extend the income tax filing deadline from April 15th to July 15th to match uh, action that the federal government took. There's really no way around doing that in Utah because so much of what we do is based on uh, federal filings. So, you know, your income Utah in Utah is based on your AGI on your federal return. And so we really, you know, we just need to extend that deadline. And because we need to extend that deadline, we've got some uh, housekeeping things to do related to the budget. The federal fiscal year starts October 1st. So this isn't uh, an issue really for the federal government, not that they care about deficits anyway, but for the state government where we do care about deficits and our fiscal year begins July 1st, by moving the filing deadline to July 15th, we're gonna be delayed on the receipt of those things in the way that spans a fiscal year. And so we're going to be shifting some money, some one-time money from 20 to 21 and 20, um, 21 to 20. Anyway, we'll make some just some technical changes so that our budgets balance in each year. It won't affect any, um, you know, your tax rates in any way or things like that. So that, that's gonna be kind of a simple bill that we do. The more complicated ones and ones that I imagine will generate some controversy and are the main reason why I wanted to hold today's meeting have to do with the actions and powers of the governor and of mayors um, and other municipalities and executives um, about how, what kinds of powers they have in an emergency like this. What structure, how long do those powers last? What kind of, uh, what kind of check do we have on the use of that power during an emergency, right? I, uh, I'd i like to get your take on that. Um, in fact, some of the questions that we'll ask you, we'll do kind of some uh, quick polls here 
uh, but I'd like to get your sense about how things are going for you, uh, you know, individually. I want to be able to make informed decisions during the special legislative session. And to me, that also means understanding how the current situation, right, like the virus and uh, uh, and that whole uh, thing is going around. And also, but most notably, the government's response to it, right? The governor has taken a lot of action, issued a lot of executive orders. So has the county mayor. And I want to know how those are impacting you and your family so that I can make an informed decision uh, when we're up at the state legislature. And I'd also like to know your opinion. Uh, do you think that the government has gone too far, not far enough? Uh, Utah is one of eight states without a stay-at-home order. Instead, we have a stay-at-home directive. And I guess the difference between that is that uh, on a statewide basis, there's no criminal penalties attached to anything. Um, I know on a county basis there is, and that's a distinction that we'll get to in a little bit. But Utah is only one of only eight states. And is that where you think we should be? Um, should we go further and do like many other states, most other states have done, and issue a stay-at-home order with attached criminal penalties? Or do you think the government has already gone too far? Or are we just Goldilocksing it and catching things just right um, by uh, giving a directive, as the governor has done, which really boils down to really, really strong advice that he expects people to follow, but is not punishing people in any way for not following? There can be a tendency um, in emergency situations like this where power is aggregated to a single source. In this case, it's typically the governor and uh, the executives of different cities to, as that power congregates there, to kind of stay there. And I'm a little bit nervous about that. I want to make sure that, A, what steps, the, what reasonable steps we take during an emergency return to their proper place after that emergency is over. And two, that even during an emergency, we don't take unreasonable steps or uh, infringe on people's freedoms in an unreasonable way. Because those, as you know, once government maintains a role and maintains power in something, it can be awfully hard for government to give that up. Um, so I'd like to hear from you guys about that. Uh, that'll be a piece that we're talking about. Another piece has to do with um, people's ability to pay rent. Um, you know, there are a lot of people uh, whose hours have been cut or who've been furloughed, um, whose businesses are no longer bringing in revenue. Um, and you know, they've still got obligations. You know, banks expect them to pay on their loans. Landlords expect them to pay on their rent. The governor at this point has issued a, a, just a blanket order saying rent is no longer due in April. It's not due till May 15th. And that no landlord, commercial or residential, can institute, um, can institute eviction proceedings for reasons of late payment if it's at all related to COVID-19. Um, I want to talk to you about that. There's a proposal in the legislature that you'll see on the handout that we've placed. And again, for those of you that are joining a few minutes into this, that's in the document section of your webinar broadcast tool. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, there's a, an effort to try to make that more narrow, that instead of giving a blanket thing that uh, is going to give you know permission to not pay rent, maybe for people who still can afford rent, and certainly be a blanket hardship on landlords, particularly I have neighbors who are retired and who rent out their basement or a second home and that rental income is their income. And so by issuing a blanket white order, we're probably going a bit too far and hitting some things we don't aim at. So uh, that's a topic that we'll discuss during the special session. Uh, and there will also be a big discussion about what steps do we need to take and when ought we to take them to reopen the economy and shift from a blanket stay home order or stay home directive to a more targeted approach um, that is, you know, perhaps directs certain people in risk categories to stay at home, but allows other people to move forward, um, allows maybe restaurants to reopen for service with some limitations about seating, some things like that. Uh, just, you know, what is the right way to, to undo this to be able to get things going again? Um, so I would love to talk about any one of those things with you or anything else that's on the handout sheet that we put in there and really any other topic that's on your mind. Uh, but I would like at the beginning to see if we can focus on the things that are coming up in the special session that, again, is going to be held next Wednesday or Thursday. So with that introduction, I did forget one piece. This isn't Zoom. Right, we're using GoToWebinar here, and so hopefully we won't be Zoom bombed in the way that some candidates and schools have been. But if by chance 
um, somebody were to hack in and do some tool and take over the course of our meeting in <laughs> an unproductive uh, way, the way that has happened sometimes you guys may have seen in the news, we'll just shut this down as quickly as we can and we'll just move this meeting onto Facebook. That doesn't quite give us the same um, interaction ability to talk to each other that this tool does, but at the very least, I could present, you could watch, you could ask questions in the comments and I could respond to those so we can still have a dialogue, even if it's not quite as productive. So with that, I see some marks uh, on the screen there, but I can't tell who's saying them or what they are, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions. And Brian, I'll look to you to tell me, are there questions in the question box? Um, or do people have their hands raised that would like to ask a question at this point? So no one has their hand raised at this point, but okay. Dwayne Bishop did want to make the comment that he says, I share Senator Fillmore's concern about the power of the state. The directives are fine. We don't need martial law or anything resembling that. <laughs> yeah, certainly I agree. You know, one one thing that you just kind of learn in existence is that you typically don't need to uh, order people to do things that are good ideas anyway. Um, and actually, you know, as you we go back about a month to when all of this started, right? Um, and the governor issued his first, had his first press conference, and then the next day when they announced that schools would be closed, things like that. Uh, by that time, people were largely social distancing anyway, right? Um, by that time. Um, Dry cleaners, for example, had already seen a 30% reduction in their business. Restaurants um, had seen uh, a 40% reduction in their business. This is these are nationwide stats, the restaurant one. So, and then of course, as things grew more, and the the governor started giving these directives or or giving this advice, you know, it started with no congregants of 100 people, and then quickly was winnowed down. But really, by the time you got to 25 and 10, people were just not getting together in those groups anyway, for the most part. There were instances like that thing at the airport, you know, that was on the news and, you know, you guys probably saw all those people congregating on the beach. Um, but just as this has gone on, I think what we've learned is that as people have good information, um, people will generally make smart decisions. And so I want the government to be on the side of providing people information, uh, really good, accurate information about how contagious the virus is. Um, who is most at risk? What uh, is the status of uh, the state's healthcare system? There can be room for uh, for directives, uh, you know, to, to incentivize behavior and things like that. But for the most part, I really do trust people to behave in a way that is responsible for themselves and their neighbors. And I think that the last month has kind of borne that out. That as you know, states that have issued those orders where there are criminal penalties. Um, that you know, their curve has gone down, but so is ours in the absence of that order. Um, and as we say that, I, I do wanna express some real concern that I have over actions that the Salt Lake City mayor has taken by instituting this, you know, tattletale on your neighbors sort of a thing. Like, like you know, the idea that we would turn ordinary citizens into people who are, you know, should be looking out their window to to catch people being bad and then report that to the police. I just, I, I, I mean, I just think that goes way too far. Um, I'm, I'm grateful not to live in Salt Lake City um, and I'm grateful that the state has not made any noise about doing anything like that. But I do think that that goes way too far. I'm also glad that we haven't taken steps like they have in California, uh, you know, where they shut down things to the point where they, you know, <laughs> uh, police came and arrested a man who was alone in the ocean. Um, because he was, you know, not participating in the social distance guidelines, even though he was, you know, a quarter of a mile away from the nearest person. Uh, it was very nice today to go uh, on a beautiful day and to walk around Daybreak Lake, and people were practicing social distancing. Uh, you know, they walk past each other on the grass, giving distance and, uh, and space, again, proving and demonstrating that when people have good information, they will make good decisions. If they have bad information, they'll make bad decisions. And so I wanna make sure that we are providing people with the best information that we can, increasing our testing protocols so that we can get more data and provide that data out to people. And so that we can really target who is at risk, who is infected, um, and uh, and just 
let people make reasonable decisions based on that data. I certainly don't want to do what other governments in other countries have done, which would be, you know, force people to download a specific app on your phone so that your government can track all your movements. I think that just is um, not part of the American spirit. Um, so I, I thank you for your comment and ready for the next one, if there is one. So there were a couple of comments on that that I did want to read. One is a, a statement saying just specifically, no informants, that's a bad idea. Right. Uh, <laughs> another one that says that agrees that they agree with the governor's approach is adequate for the state at present, but they're concerned that cities may have different issues and they should be able to impose their own regulations that make sense in their local context. Okay. Actually, Brian, I appreciate you reading that comment. And I wonder if you would turn that one into a poll that we could ask everybody. And now that we've had a bit of a discussion about things, um, we prepared a poll question that I'd like to put out now, which is, has the, has the governor's actions to this point been um, not far enough? Just about right, too far. Um, I, I'd love to be able to get the audience's feedback on that. Um, and so everybody, you should be seeing a poll question that's popping up on your thing now. If you don't mind just um, just answering that question, if you have comments about that, feel free to make those in the comment section. But I would like to get a sense about, um, you know, the legislature will certainly have the power to rein the governor in, as long as we have two thirds majority to be able to do it, right? So that if the governor has gone too far, not far enough, the legislature could take action um, and, uh, you know, we'll be poised to take some kind of action uh, next week. But I'd love to have your feedback about what that means. And if you have something specific, um, for example, I've heard from people who had been OK with the governor's actions so far, but think that the travel declaration goes a bit too far. And so if you have something specific, that is that you think has gone a little bit too far i'd love to be able to know that in the comments and if you're not up to date on the news regarding that travel thing anybody who lands in the airport in salt lake city is going to fill out a questionnaire about where they've been who they've been in contact with and also in a little bit of a big brother concern whenever anybody cell phone drives into utah and crosses a the border they're going to get an automatic um, an sms alert which is the same thing we use for like the amber alert system that will uh, ping their cell phone and uh, again, the same thing. It's like, uh, I guess, welcome to Utah. Um, please answer this questionnaire before you come here about your plans are. So to me, that seems a little big brothery, uh, maybe a lot big brothery. I'd love to get your feedback on that as well. I don't know that we have a poll question tested about that, but if you, uh, I'd love to put, if you guys had responses about that in the comments. And Brian, what do we have so far? So it looks like, so 88% of the people on responded and you should be seeing on the screen the results of, at least for the governor's directives, that about 83% of those think that it's just about right. And hopefully everybody okay. can see this on their screen, but it's it's pretty solid in the just about right and 9% okay. on either side have gone too far or not far enough. Okay, good to know. Um, I'd like to... Good information for us. Let's put the, the second question up about the county mayor, right? So our governor has issued a stay safe, stay at home directive. Um, the county mayor, which affects all of my constituents, has gone a step further, turned that into an order and ordered certain businesses specifically to close. Uh, and I'd like to know from you guys if you think that has gone too far or is that just about right or is that still not far enough? Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know, that puts a lot of people out of work. Um, anyway, we're, we're concerned about that. You know, I, I get a lot of emails from people who think the governor hasn't done far, uh, hasn't gone far enough. Right. And those typically say something like, I care more about people, more about money than about people's livelihoods. Um, I just, I, I don't, I don't put the quite the same differentiation on there. Right. It, it's, it seems pretty clear to me that, people's lives are dependent on their ability to work and sustain themselves. And I really do worry about the long-term consequences of, uh, of, a, of a total economic shutdown if we can still protect people's health without going quite so far on the economic shutdown side. So anyway, I'd love to know uh, your thoughts about that. Um, it, has the county mayor taken the correct step by issuing a specific shutdown and closing down what she has defined as non-essential businesses. 
And then when we get the answer to that question, then we'll kind of get into the specifics about what some proposed legislation uh, might do in relation to the topics that have been brought up, um, specifically about the, the difference between state power and municipal power, um, what are the limits of each one of those kinds of things, and uh, what should the structure be, all right? So appreciate that, thank you. All right, Brian, do we have an update on that question? Yep. And these are the results that uh, gone too far is about 74%, just okay. about right, 22%, and not far enough, 4%. Okay. And we All had, right. once again, 88% voting. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating. That's really helpful information for me to have. It sounds like, um, I mean, this probably isn't a representative sample of everybody that's with me. Uh, that certainly is not representative of everybody I represent. But for you that are here, I really appreciate that feedback. And what that's telling me is that uh, you you appreciate the advice to stay at home, to limit your gatherings, to stay distances away from people, but you'd be uncomfortable largely making that into a crime, right? Um, and I appreciate that. And um, thank you. Let me talk about uh, uh, some specific proposals and legislation. Uh, uh, some of which I like, and I'd be interested to get your feedback on these. So uh, if you just make those feedback in the comments or raise your hand to share, I would really appreciate it. So, um, you know, every state in the country, as well as the national government, has recognized that in the state of an emergency, uh, the governor needs to be able to have some power to get things done because it's exigent. We don't have time to wait for government by committee, which is what we typically do with the legislature, right? Um, and the, our legislature only meets for 45 days a year. And so the legislature has granted the governor um, specific powers that he can use during an emergency. Um, this is the first time that such powers have been used for this kind of a, a medical pandemic emergency. Um, and so we're kind of learning from this about um, that there are, there are gonna need to be some tweaks. And we're not gonna make a lot of those tweaks in this session, right? The, I think the, the best way to handle um, emergency precautions uh, and structure is largely to wait until things uh, are done. But there are some things that I think we ought to take straight away. And one of those is, are there any limits to a law that the governor can change on his own during the course of an emergency? Um, to me, it seems like there ought to be some limits to that, but I'm not sure exactly where to draw that line at this point, and I'd love your feedback. Um, and the second thing is there, is there any time limit based on which, on how long we can be in that emergency, right? Um, I, don't, I don't wanna overstate this or make it seem like I think that we're nearing this point, but um, just as you look at the history of governments, a lot of governments turn, um, turn into dictatorships because of an emergency, uh, emergency powers that are never let go. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not speaking about anything negative on the governor on that score, just more, you know, what are the good principles that we want to make sure that we're following here and time limits on one of those things. And, um, and another thing is, should the governor need to consult with people? And if so, with whom? Um, it's probably not uh, productive uh, or efficient to require him to consult with the legislature on everything he does, right? Um, but there might be some things that we could put that there needs to be, you know, some group of people they're advising and supporting governor's decisions, at least after a period of time. Um, and then at what point do the people get to weigh in on these things, either directly or through their elected representatives? Um, so that's something that we wanna take, in, take into account. I'd love to get your feedback on those kinds of things. Um, and finally, where is the line between what the state can do as a whole versus what counties and cities can do? If we um, if there are limitations on the governor's power, should those same limitations be on municipal power, or do we favor a more local control type option? Obviously, the Constitution, both state and federal, are still in place, um, and we would like to think that neither no elected official would do anything that might violate the state or federal constitution. But, um, but you know, like I said before about um, you know some actions that concern me about the city's mayor, Salt Lake City's mayor. Um, I think she's nearing or has crossed that point. And I think there's a decent argument that um, that an order not to leave your house to do anything except go grocery shopping um, or uh, you know, or exercise or things like that, or an order to a specific business that you may not operate 
um, may, may in fact cross a constitutional line. There are protections for private property in the Constitution, stating that the government can't take those away without just compensation. And so one question we're wrestling with is, is telling a business that they must close, does that constitute, even if it's only temporary, a government taking of that person's property? Um, so uh, anyway, they're just kind of some thorny issues that we're looking to resolve both in the long term, that probably is not going to happen next week, but also uh, kind of readjusting the dials and making sure that the people in, you know, executives, right, like the governor and his departments and local mayors are able to um, able to do what they need to do to address a true emergency situation, but not able to last that so long or go so far and do things that don't don't that really don't have anything to do with the emergency. And then what is the people's recourse if they feel like the executive has overstepped a bound? Um, so these are the kinds of questions that I'll be dealing with. And um, so now I'd like to know, uh, I see the comment thing up here, so I'm just gonna get closer. I try to stand back here because I think it looks better, but I'm just gonna get a little bit closer uh, so I can read some of these comments. Uh, Brian, what do you have for me? I know that America has a question uh, just on what you were just even talking about is okay. how can we override the governor or what is the process if we did want to override the governor as far as the legislature goes or anywhere else yeah so anything else i feel really grateful that um two years ago the voters approved uh, a way for the state legislature to call itself into a special session in a case of an emergency and that's what's going to be happening next week the governor, has, of course, has always had the power to call the legislature into special session, but especially at a time like this, we don't want to just have to sit and wait for the governor to decide that he is now ready for legislative feedback, because the legislature is the people's representative. Um, and so to answer your question, America, and thanks for coming, is that the legislature has the power to call itself into special session. We're going to call ourselves into special session. I believe that will be next Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and we're going to be addressing these kinds of things. And I don't know how many other legislators are holding a town hall meeting like this today, you know, the Saturday before this happens, or how many might do it before. I'm sure we're all working to try to get feedback from the people that we represent um, uh, to be able to, uh, to allow the people to speak um, and to dial things back. So the legislature does have the power um, uh, to uh, amend the emergency uh, the emergency law that is granting the governor this ability to waive things in a declared emergency. Uh, we could uh, we could end that emergency. We, obviously, anything that we do that the governor doesn't like, he could just veto. So this would need to have very broad based public support in order to support legislators doing something like overriding a gubernatorial veto. In this session, I don't think we're going to touch on topics that are quite that controversial. And if, you know, if you're, if everybody's feedback here, where about 80% of you seem to think that the governor's actions so far have been about right, um, I don't see the legislature going in and getting two thirds majority to override uh, much of what the governor has done. Um, but rather just to make sure that we're putting in the right guardrails. Maybe what we could do is kind of put it around so that if what we're doing now is just about right, maybe that's where we lay a new boundary for a time. But from a process standpoint, America, that's how it works. The legislature will call itself into special session, will set its own agenda, will draft its own legislation and send it forward. Where until uh, this year, the only way for us to do that would be at the governor's discretion, that he would decide when we could meet and he would decide what we could meet and talk about. So I'm glad that um, that the people have given themselves this new ability to check the governor in an emergent situation like this. And it just seems like inspiration <laughs> that uh, that uh, that had you know this bill passed two years ago, so that the people could approve it in uh, in 2018, and uh, and we could move forward on it now. Thank you for the question, Brian. What else do we have? We have a question from Carol Brown about the economic shutdown's impact on school funding and if there will be anything discussed in the special session that way. Uh, that's a really good question. And thanks, Carol. I'm, I'm glad you've made it here. Uh, Carol's my neighbor, so it's always nice to see her. 
Uh, normally we see each other at church on Sundays, but of course we haven't seen each other for a few weeks. So it's good to see you. Um, so your question about funding, the answer to that question is of course, yes, right? Um, this economic showdown, uh, you know, you guys have seen in the news that unemployment claims are way up. And what that means is uh, two things as it relates to revenue. One is that we're spending a lot more on unemployment claims than we had budgeted. And two, we're collecting a lot less revenue than we had budgeted. And of course, uh, that, uh, that's a, you know, when, we, when people don't work, that reduces the income tax revenue, right? Which is school funding. And it increases the unemployment payout, which is part of our state's general fund. But of course, when every business is shut down, or uh, that's overstating it, right? But when sales are way down and people just don't have the ability to get out and spend money, then general, the sales tax also falls. And that hurts the state's general fund and it hurts every city and county's fund. And so we're really concerned about that, but there is not likely to be any action about that in this week's special session. And the, the real reason for that is we just don't know what the impact is yet. The most current um, income tax, the most current tax collection report that the state has is from February 28th. And I tell you on February 28th, things looked golden. Uh, revenue was up 9% above the previous year. Um, but then of course, all of this happened, right? Over the course of the month of March, I'm certain that we're going to see a massive drop off in, uh, in both sales and income tax revenue collection and higher expenses in programs that are related to providing services for people in need. Um, so food, unemployment insurance, healthcare. Um, but we just don't have that data and we won't have for a little while. So this special session that is coming up next week will be the first of, I would say at least three that the legislature has in the months of April, May, and June. Um, and I'll be holding a town hall like this um, before each one. And hopefully before the one in May or June, we could actually get together at the library or something. And even if we had to set the chair six feet apart. Um, so we're not likely to take action, but Carol, I wanna expand on that a little bit. So the federal government passed this massive $2 trillion aid package, and many billions of those dollars are to come directly to states to help um, shore up education funding um, and state operations. And an additional uh, amount of money was given to states to provide to cities to shore up their budget. So I got an email from South Jordan City yesterday showing that they project that the fiscal impact on their city's budget is in the millions of dollars from uh, you know, they'll collect a lot less in sales tax revenue, um, but they are also collecting a lot less from the sports programs that they run. Um, and so, here, you know, think about the kinds of things that that does, right? It, uh, uh, so the, the state collects, the city collects less revenue from, right? The, the, my kid was signed up to play soccer right now. And actually by all rights, I should be at a soccer game today. Um, but so we're not paying that fee to play soccer. And, um, you know, the city would have had its Easter egg hunt today that they didn't have. Um, because they're not collecting that revenue, they don't have money to pay those employees who are now filing for unemployment. And that actually hurts, means that the city is paying out more in unemployment claims and unemployment insurance than, um, at, but not getting the revenue that justifies those programs. Um, so there are things like that. Those effects are going to be widespread. Um, so far, the state is, I think we'll get about $1.25 billion to help shore up the state budget and several hundred million dollars that will help to shore up city budgets. So it's, uh, I'm not confident that that will be enough. Um, but again, we just don't have that information. So the only budgetary changes that the legislature will be making in this week's special session is simply to move money from fiscal year 21, which starts July 1st, uh, and to just move one-time money back and forth. Uh, and then just to, to, I mentioned this at the beginning, but that's just because we've delayed income tax filings uh, until July 15th, which are part of the next fiscal year. So there's just some accounting things to do to make sure the budget's balanced. And then the second thing that we'll be doing is, um, taking one-time expenses. So things like the prison, for example, the state has been funding the prison construction out of ongoing revenue. Um, and that was a very smart thing to do because uh, 
Now we can just take that money back. Uh, the original plan was to issue bonds to construct the prison. Uh, by taking the ongoing revenue back and issuing bonds, we can help shore up the current budget. I think that we will be able to get through the rest of this fiscal year with um, the additional uh, aid that comes through the congressional action um, by restructuring the state's budget in the way that I talked about and by moving some ongoing revenue from one-time expenses into basic operational expenses and issuing some bonds. Uh, those, of course, will have to be paid back over time. Uh, and I don't know where the bond market is with all of this stuff, but uh, you know, certainly that has an impact on interest rates and things. But the last time the state issued bonds, it got an interest rate of 1.58%. And so if we can get anywhere close to that, that still is pretty good rate on borrowed money. Um, it's uh, you know, certainly not any higher than inflation. And so that ought to help us to be able to um, to be able to operate, you know, deal with a short-term emergency. Hopefully we can see a quick economic recovery, uh, which is something else that the legislature intends to address next week. And, um, and we can do this without having to dip into our savings account at this point, um, because that rainy day fund, we'd like to be able to, to have on hand in case this lasts quite a bit longer. Carol, I hope that that was, um, I mean, that was a very kind of a long answer to your question, but I covered everything and if not, please let me know. Uh, Brian, what else do we have? So there's a couple of comments that I want to read. Uh, yeah. One is by Mitch. He wants to say, I've read a document that the governor has a three-phase plan that has us staying home until the end of summer, if not longer, that we don't get back to a more normal routine until September or even December. It seems like we could handle this better than trying to isolate everyone, regardless of their risk, for such a long period of time. And he adds, the fact that he says this as a person who is a higher risk category and says his age, but I'm not going to say the age. Uh, here. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for that, Mitch. I actually am also in a higher risk category, not because of me necessarily, but I have a two-year-old daughter with respiratory problems. And she's been, over the last year, she's been at primary children's in the intensive care unit two times in the emergency room one other time, uh, just because when she even gets a cold, she just can't breathe. Um, so like she's in a situation where a cold can kill her without, uh, without a ventilator that can help her breathe, which we've had to do two times. So she's getting a little bit older now, um, and we've got her on some medication, but I certainly don't want to be exposing my family or my daughter to that. And so, um, even as some of these things start, uh, start getting looser, I will count myself in that higher risk category and I'll still be working to isolate myself. Um, but I think you are correct that if I don't think that we will get compliance uh, from the public to do this for an indefinite period of time, right? I mean, we're Americans, we are self motivated, and um, we are independent and self reliant, and we love and care for our neighbors. And I just don't think that it's reasonable to expect people to just indefinitely shelter themselves uh, and indefinitely. Um, you know, not work, not interact, not participate in commerce. Not, I just think that that won't last. So I think the plan you're talking about is probably his, the Utah Leads Together plan, I think he's called it. And it has three phases, the urgent phase, the recovery phase, and the stabilization phase. Um, the urgent phase is what we're in now, where we've got all the restrictions. So I have not seen, um, the document that says that we will continue this level of things through September. Um, I don't think that there's any way that can happen. Um, and I don't think that it's going to need to happen, right? E even if, you, if we just accept the fact that everything the governor has done has been appropriate to the circumstance, um, the circumstance is changing. The curve is flattening. Um, tests are becoming much more widely available. Um, you know, at this point, anybody with any amount, with any uh, COVID-like symptom in Utah can go and get a test and can get test results back more rapidly. So we're going, in pretty short order, it seems, we're going to be able to identify the people who are infected, have been exposed to those infected, and identify those who are most at risk, and so that we can better target what we're doing and allow people to engage back in with the economy and open their businesses back up and, you know, go get a haircut. Um, and I'm hopeful
hopeful that that is soon. And I sense a desire on the legislature to make, to pass legislation that that needs to happen soon. Um, but I, I haven't seen specific language about that yet, but I'm hopeful that in the legislative session, we can help that happen more quickly, or at least be on the same page with the governor that it needs to happen more quickly. Um, so Mitch, I hope, uh, I thank you for that comment. Brian, what else do we have? So we have a question about the state saving the rainy day fund and are we using that or is that still being saved by galia tanner i believe is how she says her name okay. thank you uh, i appreciate that question Galia. and it is yeah we are we will not be touching the rainy day fund in this coming special session um there's not a need to do that at this point there are other sources of revenue available to us and i want to give the state of utah um uh, you know some uh, some some love here for the way that we have structured our budget over the last several years, right? And I, I'm so I've complained that we've collected too much from our taxpayers, and I've worked hard to uh, pass a bill that would reduce taxes every year that I've been in the legislative session. And um, you know, for four of my five legislative sessions, we've had large growth, and I've been an advocate for returning some of that to the public. And that hasn't happened, which was a disappointment to me. But I would argue that the state did probably the next best thing, which is they have a lot of it in the rainy day fund. And instead of growing government by spending that money, took ongoing money to spend on one-time needed projects. So for example, you see a lot of the interchanges that are being built on, uh, on I-15 now, we're just, we haven't bonded or borrowed money for those. We're just using the revenue that has been available to do those. And so a very simple thing we can do is delay some construction projects, delay constructing some buildings. Um, we can, even short of delaying those, we can just take the ongoing, which is kind of the state operational budget out of those construction projects, put it back in the operational budget, and since I still want to make sure that we get the infrastructure that we need to handle the growth that's coming to the Southwest Valley, issue bonds to uh, to finish those, you know, those on ramps and overpasses on Bangor Highway, um, to do things like build the new Salt Lake Community College, University of Utah campus in Harriman. Uh, that was funded this year as part of our budget, and I think a big win for the Southwest Valley that I was that I really helped. Uh, work hard to push that through through so that we can have a good higher education alternative out here so that our, you know, we don't have to add to that con uh, traffic congestion by commuting up to Taylorsville and Salt Lake City to attend college. Anyway, there are a lot of reasons why, why that is a really good move. So there's a lot of tools available to us short of at this point dipping into our savings account. Um, uh, I, if this lasts a while, I imagine that there will be a use of the rainy day funds, but I don't anticipate that that will happen in this fiscal year, and it certainly will not happen at the legislative session, the special session that's being called next week. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, there's a couple of uh, follow-up questions on what can be done to limit the power of the local city and county mayors. And is there anything on the special session that would do that? Yes. So yes and yes. Um, uh, every municipality operates under the legal authority that is granted to it by the state. And so if we feel, if the, you know, if we feel like municipalities are overstepping their bounds, um, the state can uh, limit their ability to do those things. And at least on the Senate side, there is real concern about the steps that the county and the city, Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City's mayors have taken um, by, by like, I don't know what any of you guys are doing for Easter tomorrow, um, but in Salt Lake County, you are committing a crime if you have your mother over to your house for dinner, uh, assuming your mother doesn't want you, right? So, you know, I have a sister who lives in South Jordan, and uh, it would be a crime to invite her over for dinner. Um, uh, anyway, I think that's going a little bit too far. So um, I know there is going to be an effort to try to rein that in. I don't know if we'll get majority support to do that. I think we will get majority support in the Senate to do it. But um, from what I hear about the people that are leading those negotiations, there's 
more pushback on that in the House. And, um, and so, you know, we got to get majority in both houses. And if the governor, you know, is opposed to it, then we'd have to get massive majorities in both. Um, I'm hopeful that we can provide some limitations. I do want to be able to have local control, right? Like I recognize that I think one reason why it's a bad idea for the governor to issue a statewide stay at home order is that this, uh, you know, the effects of this are much different in uh, in Sevier County than they are in Salt Lake County. Um, and so I, uh, I do want there to be some degree of local control, but um, local elected officials do not have the power to violate the state constitution or to violate state law or to violate individual rights, even in an emergency in ways that are not related or not helpful. And I hope that we can dial that back. And from what it sounds like, based on my earlier poll question, where about 75% of you thought that the county mayor's actions had gone a bit too far, it sounds like you agree. Um, and so while I'm gonna continue gathering feedback from you and the people, your neighbors that I represent, um, I'm planning on, uh, on working to try to clarify what the limitations, particularly of municipal power are, uh, and to go beyond what the state has specifically authorized them to do in an emergency. Brian. Okay, one of the uh, questions is, who has the final say regarding reopening businesses and schools? Is it the governor, the county, the city? And it, it looks like there's another question kind of similar to that, just as part of your handout, it asks, has the bill about reopening businesses and establishing protocols. What do you expect to see that way? And do you expect something to pass? Okay. So uh, there are two parts to that question. The first part was who has uh, the final say in that? At this point, it's the governor. Um, that is under current law, it's the governor, right? That is the governor has declared this emergency and he is doing all of this under the auspices of his emergency powers. Um, but the legislature, of course, can change the law. Um, obviously, we would need to have either a supermajority or to have the governor's agreement to the change of that law. Um, so I think what's likely to happen on Thursday of next week is that there will be legislation that will direct uh, that will put limitations on the governor's ability to keep businesses closed for an indefinite period of time. Um, because I because I think that there's pretty wide agreement that the governor's actions so far have been pretty reasonable, and I think that the governor probably knows that too, right? I, I mean, I'm sure he's polling on this. Um, he's not up for re-election, but his favorite person is, uh, you know. And, um, and he, he, I think that he wants to make sure that he's not overstepping the bounds of what the public are going to support him doing, um, which even politics aside, that's a very good approach. Um, but I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly where that line is, right? So I'm not sure what the legislation will be, but I know there's going to be an effort uh, on the legislature's part to try to make sure that the people through their elected representatives have a say in when this happens. And um, I sense a growing uh, impatience with the people that I represent um, and a growing desire to get things back open when we can. Um, I mean, I, you know, I walk around my neighborhood every day if the weather is decent, uh, you know, like most of you, right? We get a little cooped up down here. I'm in my basement now and I am sick of this place. Uh, you know, I work down here all day, almost every day. And, you know, the ability to get outside and, you know, we interact and, you know, we keep our distance from our neighbors and wave hello instead of shake hands and stuff like that. And I, you know, saw my best friend today, as I mentioned earlier, walking, uh, walking around a lake and, you know, just can't do something simple, like give him a hug. Right. So, um, but like that can't last forever. So uh, I get the sense that people are pushing, the legislature therefore is gonna be responding to that need uh, and to that desire to try to push things to, to try to have the restrictions more targeted so that the economy can begin to open back up. Um, and I sense that that is the best, I sense that most people think that that is, would be the best way to go 
I, I'm sure even the governor would say that, that was the best way to go, but we just haven't had the data yet in order to, to, to do the targeted restrictions. But we're getting much more of that data now. Uh, I think what we're learning is that the early models of projections of, of uh, spread and uh, fatalities um, were either overstated or the steps that have been taken across the world and the country have been remarkably effective at bending that curve much lower than what anybody thought that it would be. And um, so that's, I think that we're getting to the point where we can take some additional steps. I've just gotten a, a notice that my battery is running low on my laptop. I thought I would have a good couple of hours here, but um, I'm not going to kick you out, but I'm just alone here in my basement. I'm going to run really fast and get a power cord, and I'll be back in two shakes. One sec. While he's gone, I'm going to put up one of the other polls that we had prepared ahead of time just for you to answer and see what your thoughts are. Thank you, Brian, for doing that. All right, we've got power and I'm back in front of the camera. I can't see myself because the poll question is up, but I'm trying to stand right where I was. I know I moved my laptop a little bit, but I'm back and uh, So far uh, anyway. we've had about half voting. There's still okay. some chance for some more people to vote. Yeah, this is, a, this is a good question. It gets to a lot of the comments that we've had. Um, you know, it's a, yeah interested in having your feedback. Thank you. I'm going to give it about another 10 seconds or so. We have 80% voting. Great. Thank you. All right. I'm going to close this. All right. Share with everyone the results. Huh, so pretty this even. one's pretty split. Okay. Well, that makes my decisions harder. <laughs> it's so nice when you all agree, you know? Like it just makes it so much easier. Okay. So it looked like it was pretty even between people who thought, uh, well, that's, that's, that's good to know. Um, there's, uh, you know, in that document, by the way, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, as I announced it, in the document section of, uh, of your tool there that's on your screen, you can find a document that lists about eight to 10 legislative proposals that may be on the special session um, that's coming up next week. Um, and one of those proposals relates to this specifically. Um, and there's some talk about um, having cities not have power unless the governor specifically allows them that power to go any further than he has done. Um, there's also proposals to make to say that cities can't do it at all. I prefer a proposal. My concern with what cities and counties can currently do is that we're, you, you, you guys hear me talk about this a lot, right? The missing accountability link, right? So currently what we have is that the county health department um, which is made up of unelected career government employees is guiding the decision making process. And you know, the mayor is the person who specifically issues the orders. But one thing that I know already that I would support, and I'd love to get your feedback on this in the comments if you have an idea, uh, if this is, a, if you guys uh, agree with this, is it to be able to say that when that happens, um, that it's only for a very brief period of time and that the county legislative body, right, in our case, the county council, would have the ability to come and meet and overturn that quickly. And the same at the state level, right? That uh, the governor 
can issue orders, right? Um, you know, during an emergency situation. But when he issues an order, then it automatically starts a clock by which the legislature will be called into session so that the people get a chance through their representatives to speak about the appropriateness of that action um, and to take action to either limit it or approve it um, or override it or take some steps like that. To me, it's very important that we have elected officials making these decisions that are accountable to voters and not having just government bureaucrats and employees making those decisions. Um, anyway, I'd love to know in the comments if I got a thumbs up or a thumbs down on that, uh, on that Dwayne, point of view. Dwayne Bishop actually had that very suggestion. Oh, good, good. <laughs> certainly, it, he, his comment was, certainly the governor should be able to declare an emergency. However, a time limit should be written into law where after that certain period, two thirds of the legislative body should have to approve extending the emergency beyond that number of days. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that kind of approach too. There's probably going to need to be some tweaks in there. I, I imagine that there is gonna be some possibility uh, I mean, I should say you could probably imagine a circumstance that the legislature wasn't able to specifically meet, um, <laughs> by, um, you know, in theory now it could be one of those sessions if we didn't have the technology that we do. Um, so yes, uh, Thursday, I think, yeah, Thursday night, um, we met, uh, nope, it was Friday morning. We met as a, as a, as a Senate to test out the, um, to test out the, we're going to be holding this special session virtually. And so you guys will all be able to watch the entire session as though the Senate gallery were in your living room. Um, I imagine it'll probably be broadcast somewhere. Uh, certainly it'll be on the internet. Um, and, you know, using a tool a lot like this one and also a lot like this one, it's kind of inconvenient, right? Um, you know, you kind of have to have people's microphones muted until it's their turn to speak. Um, so it, it actually took us a lot longer to do things like take the role and, and adopt the rules and stuff like that. But it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to have this ability so that in this sort of circumstance, the people can still be represented through their elected representatives. Um, by the way, here, we've been taking most comments and questions in writing. Uh, and if that's working out for you, that's fine. But I do want to, you to know that I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to ask a question verbally, just click like your raise hand button. Um, or if you can't figure that out, just make a comment. I want you to call on me um, and we'll be happy to turn your microphone on and let you participate. The, the thing that I miss the most about being, um, you know, in the library or, you know, in a building, a room with you all is the ability to have that ongoing regular back and forth, um, you know, that we often get there. It's just kind of that missing piece that we just can't solve that with technology um, yet anyway, in such an easy way. Brian, do we have uh, comments or questions? Let's see. There's a there's a couple of comments that I'll read. Is one is that cities that have a bigger issue with the virus, for example, should be able to make higher restrictions and not have to have the whole state have higher restrictions, even for remote, remote cities without any cases. Yep. Uh, another said, I agree. Elected officials should be making these decisions. Good. Uh, Thank you. There was a comment that says cities and counties should talk to the governor and be like-minded. If there's more concern in certain areas, the governor should be able to address those. Okay, and then, so keep uh, it at the state level. And then she said, yes, I totally agree with you, Lincoln. Okay, great. Let's see, and there is one question on bonding okay. and the, from Belinda. She's asking about, is it a good idea for roads to be built right now as the interest rates are so much lower is an inflation issues and kind of constructing those roads uh good question and actually that is related to this because we are going to be taking some money in our budget that has been dedicated to construction projects like roads and buildings and shifting that into other areas of the budget where there's going to be a shortfall um and so the only way to build those roads would be we, we can either delay the construction of them or we can issue bonds. A month ago, I would have said for sure we should issue bonds. I'm not sure where interest rates are today. You know, in my professional life, I work in the finance field a lot. And we were set in February 
uh, I was working with a school that was set to issue facility bonds at about 5%. And they, they're going to, they closed instead on those bonds just yesterday at 6.5%. And so where the state uh, only a few months ago borrowed at 1.58%, I imagine that we're going to have to borrow at a slightly higher rate at this point, but still the rate of interest, I would predict for a state with a AAA bond rating with very good credit, um, uh, with a growing population, that the costs of borrowing money are actually lower than the costs, particularly re related to construction, um, uh, than the cost of the materials and the labor to build those. So I do think it makes sense to bond for building roads like the Mountain View Corridor and turning that into a freeway. It's about an $800 million project. And to finish the freeway interchanges on Bangor to get all the way from I-15 all the way up to 21st South, where it, it does turn into a freeway. And to get all of that done is about a $500 million project. Um, I supported issuing bonds for that during the legislative session. We weren't able to get that done this time. There just wasn't broad enough support by that. And I can understand that, right? As we were dealing with our budget, it was like, we've got big surpluses. We don't need to be borrowing money at this point, which I understand. Um, uh, but especially now, assuming we get back to normal at some point where interest rates are going to be, you know, somewhat like they have been over the last little while, and where if the economy is still very good, then I would predict that construction costs are going to be increasing faster than at a, than interest would would accrue on on those kinds of bonds and besides which the county approved olympia hills and we're going to have a lot more people moving out here over the next decade to two decades and we should not wait a decade to two decades to put the infrastructure in uh, to be able to accommodate that growth so especially from a standpoint of roads and water um, I, I do think that we need to make sure that we've got the ability to to finance the growth that we can see that we can see coming. Thank you. I, I, I don't even have my watch on me to know what time it is. Uh, we've been here, I assume, a little over an hour. Am I right about that? Yes. Um, so I'm happy to keep going for a while. I think I think we've largely covered what are going to be the controversial topics that come up at the special session, and I'm really grateful to have your feedback. Um, we can keep getting into more details about that, or if you have questions about uh, about other topics, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Let me read a couple of comments. Uh, these are actually uh, opposing to each other, so I thought it would be oh, interesting yeah, to you. hear the different thoughts. One from Al says, no one person, even with expert medical advice, should be making decisions that affect the entire population. This warlike situation should be dealt with by the legislature and the governor together. Okay. And then Ian is has a little bit of a different take on this. He says, in this case, we should have expert opinion from people with epidemic credentials rather than legislators who are potentially open to considerations other than what is best for the public health. Okay. No, uh, that, uh, you know, that disparity actually mirrors uh, what I see in my email box every day, right? I get a fair amount of emails from people saying, we need to go to war with this. We need to take bold action now. We need to shut things down even further than we have. And I get at least an equal number of emails saying, what in the world is going on? I thought this was America. Why are we shutting these businesses down? This is no worse than the flu. Um, uh, you know, I represent people with a wide range of points of view. And so because I do, and I know there's going to be disagreement, I'm, I'm glad that here uh, it seems like we have pretty broad consensus on the scope of the response so far being just about right, um, uh, but that the county has gone a little bit too far. Uh, so I really appreciate that feedback. When it comes down to that disparity, I always try to go back and think about the principles that I promised to hold when I was elected and that I think create the sound principles. And one of those is to make sure that because this is, this is a government of people, right? And particularly in Utah, the legislative power is shared with the legislature and the people. And I wanna make sure that, um, uh, at least for my part, right? Uh, that the principle that I'm standing on is that I wanna make sure that the people make, making, when government makes decisions, that that government can stand accountable to the people. Um, and so I am 
all in favor of the governor getting very good advice from a wide range of people. And I think that I think they're a good idea in legislation maybe to require, um, you know, a, a relevant committee to be established to advise the governor on what steps that he should take rather than let, just having, um, you know, to Ian's point, we don't want people just, res excuse me, responding to whims of public opinion as they might blow back and forth, right? Um, uh, it's important to take public into uh, public opinion into account, uh, but that can't be the only thing, right? There also does need to be some expert opinion, but that the decision makers need to be accountable to the people. Um, that I'm going to go to a legislative session next week and I'm going to cast some votes, and um, I expect to be able to come back and report to you about what I did and why I did it what advice I got, what, what I had in my mind as I made this decision versus this decision. I've tried to do that in my legislative career so far. And I just want you to know that I'll continue to use that as my approach. And it's really why I'm holding this meeting and why I'm so grateful for that we get people from left and right and center uh, to be able to come through here. And, and just want to encourage you again to keep that line of communication open. You all have my email address, which is Lincoln at LincolnCommerce.com. You shall have my cell phone number, which is 801-548-0144. Um, uh, if you miss either of those, I'm not going to repeat them uh, endlessly, but you can just go to lincolnfillmore.com and you can find all my contact information. I want to be open and accessible to you, so please continue to email and call. I appreciate getting all of those, and I think if you've, uh, you know, if you've taken that advantage before, um, you'll you probably have noticed that every time I get an email, I try to engage in a dialogue so that I can have a broader understanding about where you're coming from, right? Um, uh, especially if you've written me a, a, a thoughtful email that wasn't just, you know, generated by some website where, you know, sometimes I get 100 of the, of the exact same email. But if you've taken time to put your thoughts down on paper, I'll try to you so we can understand each other. I feel like I do better and that you can do a better job holding me accountable when we have that open line of communication open and we have a real partnership. Um, you know, knowing that uh, that I'm there in the state legislature to represent you and to make uh, the best decision that I can about what I think is best for you and our neighbors. So I appreciate uh, that feedback. Okay, we have a question from America. She's asking about the co what kinds of consequences can happen if people make choices that impact others instead of closing all the businesses and i'm guessing she's talking about like if someone's sick or if someone has the covid 19 what can be done to stop them from spreading it versus shutting down all of the other businesses yeah i think there are a lot of of directives that the state can issue besides just everybody stay home um and i think that there's a reasonable argument to be made that for the first several weeks um, that may have been the right approach. Um, but as we are getting more information, right, we're learning more about the virus, we're learning more about what its effects are, we're learning more about how our reaction has had an effect, uh, and we're especially getting faster and better at testing people uh, that I think we can target that. You know, we might just say, you can still go out in public, wear a mask. Um, uh, you know, you can go out to eat at a restaurant, but restaurants, you need to limit the number of people that you serve at any one time so that, um, you know, people can still remain six feet apart. Um, I mean, there are steps you can take. And again, I would point out that I don't, you don't need to mandate good ideas. Um, for example, you guys saw, if you guys, you guys have been grocery shopping and you've seen that stores are not because they've been told to, but just because it's a smart practice. They are, um, they've adjusted their hours so that they can do more frequent cleaning of their stores, right? Um, they have, they're limiting the numbers of people that can be allowed into the grocery store at any one time. Um, they've increased the supply of those wipes they use, you know, to wash your countertop. They put up plexiglass between uh, customers and cashiers, right? Um, like some sort of increase the number of self-service lanes and, um, you know, I went to Roxbury today to get a smoothie, and um, you know, the the person who was helping us had a pair of gloves on as she was preparing our our smoothies. She handed us our smoothies. I handed her a credit card. She took the credit card, 
uh, swiped it, handed it back, took off the gloves, put on a new set of gloves, right? Like those are the kinds of practices that we could do that are short of shutting down the economy that I think will also have a measured effect. And uh, as we look out from this for quite some time, the social distancing measures, you know, all of these things that we have done, the point of this is not to eliminate the virus, which is not within the government's power to do. And while the, you know, while there are uh, government uh, epidemiologists and private companies working on developing a vaccine, um, and that, that vaccine uh, may, you know, hope will come hopefully sooner rather than later, um, the virus is still there. It's still contagious. The goal of this has been to spread out the sickness over a longer period of time so that we don't overcome, overwhelm the healthcare system. But I don't you know, I fully expect to get infected with this virus at some point. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm nervous about how that's going to affect my daughter. And so, you know, we're trying to make family contingency plans for what we'll do in such a circumstance to try to limit the spread to her. Um, but social distancing, you know, as long as the virus, as long as anybody is carrying a contagious virus, it's going to spread at some point. The goal is to slow the spread and spread it out. Um, uh, and hopefully by doing that, we can, you know, we can not keep the healthcare system operating so that it can provide treatment to those who are infected and reduce the number of people for whom this, uh, such an infection, you know, either kills them or, or, you know, makes them have to take such time off of work, things like that, right? We want to be able to get, to get to people when they're sick. And also because people also have heart attacks and get injured, um, and we want to be able to make sure that we can treat those people as well. We want to we want to be able to protect the people that provide that valuable medical service, uh, as well as um, make sure that there are, we have a few enough patients that we can get to the people as we have emergencies. Um, but I, you know, shutting down the entire economy, but still expecting most people will be exposed to this virus at some point. I just think we need to strike a better balance as we get more data. And I'm very glad to see that we're getting more data and that what we're finding is that what we're doing it has been working. Um, and uh, I hope that's a lesson to other states across the country so that you, you don't need to come down on citizens with a hammer you know, and threats. Uh, or like I talked about earlier, you don't need to turn neighbors into uh, agents of the local police department by spying on and tattling on their neighbors. I, I mean, that just, that just seems so un-American to me. Um, and um, anyway, I, I, I have been just, um, I've been thinking about this a lot, right? So this has been a hard situation, I think, for everybody. And I've been on the phone two to three hours a day, every day, talking to people about how this is impacting you and your family. And some of you, I've had this conversation with you that are on this phone call now. And, uh, um, you know, I, I've been asking that and, you know, we have a lot of people that are in a situation like I am where, you know, so far the impact on me personally has been very minor. I have, I largely work from home anyway. My kids are two and five and haven't even started school. And so the fact that school is shut down doesn't really mean much um, for our family, right? We're going to be uh, here with the kids quite a bit. It's been inconvenient. We can't go and do the things that we often like to do. Um, uh, you know, our, our my old son's preschool has been canceled. There's been some inconvenience. And as I mentioned before, I'm really growing to dislike being in my basement. Um, but there are people that I've been speaking to who have health problems. Um, I, I talked to a, um, to a man whose son is in the hospital and, he, and, and dying, not of COVID, but he just cannot go visit his son in the hospital. And what a tragedy. Um, that is. Um, and, uh, you know, I talked to people yesterday who've been furloughed from work. Um, the impacts of this are real and devastating. Um, and I want to make, I want to do everything that I can to help our community recover from this. But in the midst of all of that, um, I've just seen so much uh, good in the world. And I am just so pleased at, you know, like you must be when you read you know, on Facebook and interact with your neighbors about how, hey, we're concerned about our neighbor who owns a restaurant that's not doing well. So like, let's spend more going out to eat than we normally would have done um, because we wanna make sure that we support our neighbors. And 
you know, uh, this week our neighborhood got together and had a social distancing picnic where people brought their little, you know, we sat as family groups on our blankets and we were 10 feet away from our neighbors, but we were able to get out and socialize. And one of my neighbors um, this morning did a, um, a social distant Easter egg hunt where, you know, they hid Easter eggs around the local park here and invited kids to come out. And but in, so instead of having, you know, like if you've ever been to the city Easter egg hunt, right? It's just like a, a swarm of, of kids trying to chase after candy. It was distant, it was spread out. And this neighbor had just put uh, prizes inside these eggs that people could come and trade. So it's just that kind of cooperation just to me indicates that people are good and we will do the right thing when we have the right information. And there, of course, that doesn't apply to everybody because I know there are scams about this. You know, you get emails about um, stupid things that people are doing, uh, you know, trying to milk this for an advantage. Um, and, you know, you saw people, hey, I don't care about COVID. I'm not going to let it stop me from partying, right? If you saw that on the news. So there are uh, always going to be some minority of people that are going to behave stupidly. But just existing in this environment lets you see. Um, how great people are um, and how we can come together in facing a crisis like this. And it just gives me so much more confidence in the people um, that I, I, I just think we're going to be so much better off if we, uh, as the government, right, if our approach is to be open, transparent, accessible, um, to do what only the government can do uh, and to do that well, but really, to just provide people with the information that they need so that they can make good decisions. Um, and uh, that's kind of the approach that I, that I try to take about that. Brian, do we have more questions or comments? Yeah, we do have a question from Cheryl. He asks the question of, have any government offices been closed with employees furloughed, or is it mainly on the private enterprise side? Uh, I am not aware. Uh, I mean, I don't follow, you know, what's happening at, at the Massachusetts governor's office or things like that. But if you're asking about the Utah governor's office, no. Um, and since I work in public schools, you know, the directive has been from the state has been do, don't lay people off. Don't furlough them. Even though students aren't in school, uh, you know, they're providing a lot of distance education. But the truth is there's not as much work when kids just aren't in school, right? There's not as much to clean. There's not as much behavior to manage. Um, education doesn't take as long when kids aren't in school, right? You, um, um, and so, but the directive has been not to furlough, not to lay people off. And that directives have come both from the federal and the state governments. And so people who work for government agencies are largely still employed. My sister works for a city in uh, Idaho, and she is working from home, but still, still employed, still getting her paycheck. Um, and uh, you know, it's an interesting thing where the people that are making these decisions are kind of insulated from the private sector effects of what they're doing. Um, it makes me really grateful to have a a part-time legislature, right, where. Um, our legislature, our legislators are really part of the economy. And, um, you know, uh, I get a small salary for the work that I do in the state legislature, but it's, it's like 20,000 bucks a year or something like that, right? But my income comes from working in the real world. Um, and most legislators' incomes come from working in the real world. In fact, I said just last, you know, I've been working on starting a new, uh, a new business for several months and I'm just, kind of getting down that road. Of course, this kind of put a, a, a new perspective on those plans, but it just, it just it points out to me that how much I need to get information from you in order to make good decisions. And I hope that the governor feels the same way about that. I can appreciate why he would want to talk to experts like the state epidemiologist and the director of the Department of Health and lots of other people that are on the government payroll. Um, but I was nervous at the beginning that it appeared to me like the governor was um, kind of really focused on that aspect of it and less focused on the on the economic damage that's also was being done. Uh, I'm persuaded that he's kind of turned that corner and has involved the private sector a lot more. Um, but uh, again, it just illustrates to me why it's so important 
that the people have the chance to have their voice in this um, through their elected representatives, through meetings like this, where we can talk and go back and forth with each other. And I hope that answered Cheryl's question. So it looks like we do have a question from Al Holland. He writes that Senator Romney is proposing that a task force be formed in addition to existing emergency preparedness measures to deal with catastrophic situations like this. Understanding that the nation and many states and cities were not prepared for this pandemic, should this be considered here in Utah? I'm confident that it will be considered. Uh, I doubt that it will be on the special session agenda for this Thursday, but I think once we get past this and things return to something considering normal and we can look at things through, um, you know, through a, a clear lens, but with this kind of in the close enough in the rear view mirror, um, that we can uh, really take steps to make sure that both at the national and the local level um, that we've got the ability to respond more quickly. You know, like we learned pretty quickly through this process that um, that testing and personal protective equipment were something that was just insufficient to be had. Um, and it, those, I think, are things that we could um, that we could handle pretty inexpensively. You know what I mean? From like a a, uh, a stockpiling standpoint, right? Um, you know, it's, I guess it's been something like 100 years since the last one of these went around the world like this one has. And of course, our world is a lot more interconnected now than it was then. Um, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see, I think, how, how if this becomes more frequent. Um, uh, uh, Anyway, that's a little bit of a worry I have, and that if we do have a worry that this might be more frequent, we certainly need to be better prepared uh, in the future. And this experience, uh, I think, can teach us what we can do to be better prepared for that. So, um, yes, I haven't heard about Senator Romney's proposal, and of course, the national government's role would be very different from the state government's role. But I think it's reasonable to say that you know the the federal government has a strategic petroleum reserve, and uh, you know, it, it may be a decent idea to have something like a strategic medical reserve or something like that, right? A strategic pandemic reserve um, to address something like this. So I, I appreciate that question. So that's all the questions we have. All the right. Only other statements are just appreciating your time and as they had to leave to go and do other things in their lives. <laughs> of course. Well, I for those of you that still remain, thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate the feedback I was able to get from that. That, uh, um, that really gives me a, a good perspective to be able to take this into the special session next week. Um, I'll report back to you after the special session, uh, certainly by email. I don't want to overdo town hall meetings, um, uh, if there is such a thing as overdoing town hall meetings, but I do want to make sure that we're connected back. I would anticipate that there will be another special session within a matter of a few to several weeks. Um, so I'm sure we'll get a lot of opportunities to talk back and forth. Um, uh, uh, I know that some of you that were attending the meeting today are delegates at the County Republican Convention, which is being held a week from today. So I want to remind you that if you haven't already today to go and uh, download the votes app that will be part of that convention. They are running a test on that today. Please participate in that test to make sure that everything uh, is working properly. And of course, I would love to have your vote. Um, uh, and I hope that um, that um, you know that this kind of dialogue um, is the kind of dialogue that you want to see, um, and that you'd be willing to support me so that we could continue this partnership that we've built over the last four years, as I've uh, served you in the Senate for a term. Um, and so, with that, I want to thank you all for being here, um, and uh, uh, we'll. I'm certain that we will talk again <laughs> again soon. So, thank you. Stay safe and stay healthy. Um, and enjoy your Easter uh, and your Easter weekend. I really appreciate you. Thanks. Bye-bye.